Hello and welcome to this Somerville Live edition from Somerville Media Center City Council Update. I'm Joe Lynch. Today is April 14th, 2020. I'm joined by Somerville City Council President Matt McLaughlin and Ward 3 Councilor Ben Ewan Camp. And gentlemen, good afternoon. How are you both doing today? Doing all right, Joe. I'm doing just fine. How are you, Joe? Excellent. I'm doing good. The sun is out. It's a, a promise of spring. So let's begin. Um, Matt, you're making your third appearance, I think, on, on Somerville Media Center Live. You've been conducting uh, the public health and public safety meetings. What's the latest update you have for us this week? Yeah, thanks, Joe. And I thank you for giving us the opportunity to keep meeting. Uh, we'll keep doing this every week until we get through this. Um, and it's a great time to do it because we have our public health and safety meetings on Mondays. So I get to update people with the most recent information right now. Uh, so just a quick rundown of statistics as well as advice for neighbors. Uh, as of April 13th, 2020, uh, 258 residents have been tested positive with the coronavirus, COVID-19. Uh, 71 have recovered and there's still uh, one fatality. Uh, so the fatality rate hasn't gone up yet. Uh, between April 6th and April 13th, there have been 84 new cases for a 48% increase, uh, which is an average of 12 new cases a day, which is in keeping with the uh, last week's uh, statistics as well. I want to let people know that the City Council is fully operational right now. We're holding our meetings remotely, even having community meetings remotely. Uh, this week, we have a full uh, week of uh, council meetings, uh, some of it not having to deal with COVID-19. So we're functioning as a government as well as responding to this crisis. A few updates for the community. Uh, Mayor Kurt Atoni has put out uh, an advisory for people to wear masks. Uh, we discussed this last week and he has kind of reinforced that need to wear face masks when you're outside, whether it be a cloth mask or something. And this is uh, for not only to prevent yourself from getting it, but especially if you have it and you're not testing positive, if you're not showing symptoms, uh, you could still transmit the disease. So this is meant to prevent you from spreading that disease. Uh, the city has advised people to not personally go out and enforce this standard because it is an advisory. Uh, people aren't gonna get pulled over right now for not wearing a mask. Um, and that's important. I heard a few people ask why that's the case. And it's really important for people to not be the police in this situation. And not only because you have no enforcement authority, but you don't want to go near somebody and tell them, you know, you should be wearing a mask because now you're not respecting social distancing. Uh, and you could possibly make in a conflict that's not necessary. So leave that up to the authorities and, uh, you know, hope that people do the best, uh, do the right thing. Um, Grocery stores uh, recently have been ordered to operate at 40% capacity to further facilitate social distancing guidelines. Uh, so we encourage people to plan ahead and expect a longer than usual grocery store shop. Um, this is meant to respect social distancing to prevent the disease from spreading because the supermarket's the one place we all have to go. Uh, so please respect those social distancing goals. Uh, the property tax bill, I put this out in the email, but it came out after our conversation last week. Uh, property tax bills that were otherwise due on May 1st can now be paid by June 29th without interest or penalty. Uh, for excise and water bills, the city's treasury department will not charge any interest or penalties for bills with a due date as of March 10th or later, as long as they're paid by June 29th. Uh, some of old public events are still closed until uh, through June right now uh, and expect more updates on that. Street sweeping has been postponed until May. Um, and then I'd also like to plug the city of Somerville's 311 Constituent Service Division. Uh, they've launched a new initiative to provide constituents with access to one-on-one -on -one experts during the COVID-19 public health crisis. Uh, you can call them if you need any help navigating uh, financial assistance, food assistance, unemployment, information about COVID-19. Uh, you can call 311 for almost anything. And then the last thing I'd like to um, mention to people, you know, in the public health meeting last night, uh, people are still allowed to go out for their walk uh, if they feel like they have to do that. But our public health uh, director, Doug Kress, told people, you know, this is, this is not advising people to do so. Uh, people are highly encouraged to stay inside at all costs and the going outside for a walk is really just acknowledging that somebody may have to do this at some point. 
So, uh, you know, we get a lot of requests from people to close the streets uh, so people can walk or open this area up so for more pedestrian accessibility. And we really value pedestrian accessibility in Somerville. It's very important to us, but we don't want to encourage anybody to go outside and walk if they don't have to. If you really feel compelled that you have to go take a walk and get some exercise, do so by respecting social distancing. But the city has strongly advised people that when you don't have to do that, do not go outside unless you really have to. Uh, so that's all I have. And I'm grateful to have my colleague, uh, Councilor Ewan Campin, with me today. I wanted him to be the first guest because not only is he a scientist, he's a biologist. Uh, and that has been a great uh, benefit to the city council. He's also a great activist when it comes to a lot of these issues on the city and state level uh, when dealing with uh, you know, evictions, uh, moratorium on evictions and housing issues and all the issues that are really important right now. So I'll just turn it over to Ben and uh, thank him for coming. Take it away, Ben. Thank you very much. It's wonderful to be here. Thank you, Councillor McLaughlin and Joe. Um, so what, what I really wanted to talk about today is testing. This is something that I've gotten a lot of questions about specifically why don't we have more testing? Why is it so hard to get a testing? Uh, but, but before I do that, I also just wanted to make sure for anyone watching this, any questions that you have, um, really the best place to go is the Somerville dedicated website for the coronavirus. So this is somervillema.gov, G-O-V slash coronavirus. And there are not only almost daily updates with all the statistics, but there's also links for any type of um, assistance that folks needs, whether that is food, getting connected to resources at the state or federal level. There is so much information coming out. Things are changing at such a quick rate that it, it, it's really hard to know uh, what the latest guidance is. And that is really the best place to get all that information, as well as, as, as Councilor McLaughlin said, calling 311. Ben, um, ben, before you go in, I'm going to ask you one question because it is my job to irritate scientists. So I want to ask you one question. On March 6th, 2020, who said this? Anyone who wants a test can get a test. That sounds like something that uh, our Nobel Prize winning President Donald Trump might have said. Yes. <laughs> just, just my nature to get you going, Ben. Take it away. Yeah. Um, you know, so I, I want to start this by saying I have never been so impressed with Somerville, not only as a community, but as a, a local government. I think that our administration, city council, the mayor's office, everyone who works for the city has just been doing a, a truly tremendous job in responding to this way before the rest of the state, the rest of the country did. Um, and I, I don't like to uh, pass the buck, <laughs> point fingers, but I think when it comes to testing, there's really no way to understand where we are without talking about what the federal government failed to do. Um, so as Councilor McLaughlin mentioned, I'm a, I'm a biologist. I, I don't, I'm not an epidemiologist or anything, but I've been attending a lot of talks on the subject. And I think the, the two big questions are, first of all, why has there been so little testing? And no, it's, uh, it's Councilor Campin's connection. Oh, yeah. Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. Yep. All right, just stop me if this gets uh, clunky again. Okay. So as everyone knows, this, this virus was first detected in China. Um, and very quickly, the World Health Organization designed a test that seemed to work very well. The United States government uh, decided to not use that test and to design our own test through the CDC, which is a fairly standard thing to do. Um, However, the test that they designed and distributed to labs around the country didn't work. And it's really hard for me to emphasize enough what a disaster that is. These are not complicated tests. You know, if anyone watching this has taken a college biology class in the last decade, you've probably done PCR. Uh, PCR is really one of the most basic molecular biology techniques there is. And that's what this test is. And the fact that it failed is just inexcusable. Um, so while that test uh, was not working, the CDC also passed a guide guideline saying that no independent laboratory, whether that's a hospital or a state lab, could invent their own test. 
which just to emphasize again, would not have been a major challenge, but they were legally stopped from doing so by the federal government. Um, so that was basically accounts for the entire month of February. So this is when the virus was first starting to spread in our country. There were literally just hundreds of tests were done in the country, which is a catastrophic failure. Now, at this point, we have tests that work and we have a lot of different new types of tests that are coming out, including, you know, what people describe as uh, these pregnancy kit tests, a little strip. 15 minute tests, right. 15 minute tests. The issue now is the supply chain. So now we have tests that work very reliably. That's not the issue. Now the issue is producing these tests and also producing just the basic medical supplies that you need to administer the tests. So as one example, um, the swabs that are used to collect the sample from in people's noses, uh, these are now extremely hard to get your hands on. These are extremely limited. Uh, one reason for this, one of the major factories that was producing, this is a small, I think it's a 20 cent piece of plastic, but they're, they're produced in a factory in Lombardy, Italy. And as everyone knows, Italy is one of the countries most hard hit by this. And so uh, every time that supplies for these tests are now created at factories, they're immediately absorbed into the supply chain and we're back where we started. So because of how limited the testing is, uh, they have to really strictly regulate who can get these tests. And by and large, this has meant people who are showing symptoms or people who are known to have been uh, exposed in some cases. And here's the issue. Um, right now, we have no idea how many people have coronavirus in America. And that is really just the thing that people need to understand is in order for our country to make decisions about what to do next, we need to understand how many people have this virus. In order to understand the basic biology of how this disease works, you know, the, the mortality rates, the severity rates, the age distributions, we need to understand how many people have it. And right now, we're, we're basically flying blind. We could have, you know, there's something on the order of 500,000 confirmed cases in this country now. That could be several orders of magnitude off. And why that's so important, if there really are 10, 20, 50 times more cases out there, that actually teaches us a lot about this disease. That would mean that in fact, uh, and again, this is hypothetical, we don't know if this is the case, but hypothetically this could mean um, that the, the mortality rate is actually much lower than we feared. Because in fact, there are many more millions of people out there who are, they have it, but they're, they're not suffering from it. And, and while they have it been, um you know, I'm not an epidemiologist either, but they are building up a certain immunity to the virus itself. They're able to fight it off with their own body antibodies. So I wish that I could be as confident as that. My understanding is, well, there's no reason to believe that that isn't the case. Uh, we do not know that. Right. We do not know for a fact that people who have been exposed and who have gotten well, um, that they are now immune. We are hoping that's the case, but that is not proven science. So, you know, one of the things that's really frustrating about listening to epidemiologists who talk about this is that they will tell you, we don't know where we are. Right. We don't know how many people have it. And because we don't know how many people have it, we don't know what the next step is. Right. So again, hypothetically, if right now 80% of America had it, that would actually be kind of good news for us because it would mean we are probably closer to herd immunity. And it would mean that the, the mortality rate is much lower than we were feared. But we can't, we don't know. And we really won't know until the testing is widespread. Well, so it's fascinating, and, Ben, let me jump in for one second. It is fascinating from what we're seeing in the stats is that older folk and people with immune compromised um, systems are more susceptible to death than younger folks. But that number is inverse based on what I'm looking at now that the vast majority of the cases that are being confirmed as COVID-19 cases are between the ages of 29 and 52, which says they were not taking the physical distancing guidelines as serious as they should have at the very beginning of this and just kept infecting each other because they weren't staying away from each other. Does that kind of make sense to you as a 
scientists? Absolutely. I, I think we now know without question that this was spreading what they call community transmission in, in cities across the country in February. Uh, you know, there's a very long time between when someone is actually contracts the virus and when they show any symptoms. And we now know for a fact that this was spreading long before, you know, weeks before um, governments were, were telling citizens to stay home. Or to do hence hence that, that last month of February, exactly. when people were still trying to figure things out and no one was taking any solid action. Exactly. And, you know, I'll just, the last thing I'll say on this, um, so in an ideal world, what you would do is you would take a num an enormous number of people in the country and just randomly test them and try to get a sense, regardless of who's showing symptoms, what's the just average infection rate? Sure. And we don't have the capacity to do that, but I did see there was a study, I believe this morning or yesterday in the New England Journal of Medicine uh, from one hospital where they randomly tested 100% of the women who came in uh, for labor to, to, to give birth. This was something around you know, 220, 230 women. Um, some of them were symptomatic for coronavirus, but the large majority of them were not. And what they showed from this one study was that uh, of the people who had coronavirus, 88% of them were not showing any symptoms. Right. And that, that's really striking. You know? And that's, again, this is just one snapshot in time. So we don't, maybe two days later, those women did have symptoms. So you have to, there are caveats to this, but that number is really quite striking. And it just goes to show you that presumably a large number of people who get this virus don't show symptoms. And that so, is why we are, it's so important that people stay home and if they do go out, that they wear masks. So the message from you in, in that terrific explanation is people cannot let down their guards. They have That's to right. keep washing their hands. They have to wear masks when they go outside. They have to be careful of anything that they touch. They have to keep their hands away from their face because that's how this virus enters its host. It's coming in through your eyes, your nose, your mouth. I, I don't know if it's entering through the ears, but I assume it needs a pathway to get in. And once it's in there, we've seen in the cases, the, the death toll in this country, it's a, it can be a killer for certain people. The other takeaway from you is we're never going to get a handle on this thing until we know how many people are infected and who, what that database looks like. Um, so I guess my question, let me bring it back to the local side and both of you, either one can take this question or both if you wanna chime in. What are we doing here locally for our first responders? Who are the folks that cannot stay home? Those are the firemen, the policemen, the ambulance drivers. Those first responders are gonna be the first ones called in a medical emergency. So what are we doing for them? in testing them right now today anything yeah so um i place an order at the last council meeting and we discussed it last night about making sure our first responders were tested uh regularly uh to ensure that not only as you mentioned you know many people don't even display symptoms but they can transmit it to someone and our first responders don't have the option to shelter in place uh, they have to go to people's shelters and possibly be exposed. So I place that order, uh, hoping that we can do that. Uh, there are options currently available uh, for first responders to voluntarily go to locations. I think there's one in Lowell, there's one in Foxborough, where they can go and get tested. Uh, but it's on a voluntary basis. Uh, it's not a regular thing. And it's a good distance away. So a lot of people may not uh, even take advantage of this. And they're also you know, on the law, and I think some of the hospital also has that um, it, so, opportunity so, for people. So Matt, let me ask you the question. Does that make any sense to send the Somerville Police Department and Fire Department to Lowell or to Springfield? What, I mean, I, I, let, me, let me ask the question directly because I get hot about this stuff. Yeah. Why is Cambridge Health Alliance not testing our first responders? Well, that's what I was just saying is uh, they can also go to the Cambridge Health Alliance and get this, but that's for patients in general. Um, so that is an option, but the problem is, as Ben was saying, is we just don't have enough tests to make this happen. So I would like first responders to be tested the moment they get to work every day uh, to make sure that they're not carrying and then to separate them and quarantine them if that is the case. And we just don't have that capability. That's what's so frustrating about this right. is there's things we should be doing and we can't because of what Ben was talking about with the federal government. Ben, I have a follow-up question for you in terms of the testing. So assume someone is asymptomatic. 
and we have testing set up for our first responders. They go in, they take a test 15, 20 minutes later, no, you're negative. How many more times would they have to be tested in order to get a true reading that they are negative? Or do they have to continue to be tested? So I don't want to pretend that I'm a doctor here. And you know, speaking to your last question, I also just wanted to add to what Councillor McLaughlin just said. At our meeting last night, we were informed from the administration that at this point, the, the fire department is treating every medical call as if it was a positive case and they're wearing full personal protective equipment. Um, and, and I would just add to that that uh, the, the, the inability to get sufficient personal protective equipment is another one of these just, uh, it's hard to control the anger when, you're, when you think about how catastrophic this failure has been, where we have states are literally fighting against each other and against private companies and against the federal government just to get masks for firefighters, for police department. And I would add to that, you know, all everyone is working down a market basket at Star Market. You know, these are folks who are performing absolutely sure. essential functions. Sure. People who do not make a ton of money and who are exposed to an enormous amount of risk. And I don't think that anyone can look at the situation now and say that they're being treated fairly or being taken care of. Um, you know, I think that the, what we've been talking about today where, you know, we're, we're a month into this already and we're still asking people, stay home, wash your hands, wear a mask. Um, you know, that is not an easy ask for huge, huge, huge amounts of people in our society. People who uh, either have to work because they work at somewhere essential, um, you know, people have to make rent, people have to take care of their kids, you know, there are, um, we are asking a lot of people and the government, the federal government is not giving folks the resources that they need to follow the best public health guidance. And that is yeah. one of the things that's so frustrating about this is, you know, I've been one of the people, the loudest telling everybody to stay home very early on and the whole time knowing full well, you know, you're asking people to take a huge hit to your livelihood. Right. And right. Uh, sort of just hoping and praying that the federal government steps in and makes it possible for businesses to stay afloat and for folks to cover their bills. No, I don't think there's a whole lot of people that how the feds have been operating on this, Ben. You know, it's every man for himself kind of position that they've taken. I don't think that's escaped a lot of people. But I want to go back to the local level here for a minute. So we're trying to stop the spread. We're, we've given guidelines that we really can't enforce a whole lot because they are guidelines, they're not orders. Um, one of the things that's come to mind over the past couple of weeks is contractors, smaller contractors continue to perform work in this city, even though they are required to go to ISD and get some kind of a sign off that they fit that mold. I can tell you from personal observation on my small street here, no one's enforcing this. So is it really just a case of where we have a bunch of scoff guidelines that are being issued and no one's enforcing them? I mean, these small contractors are still working. I see them walking up and down the street with no masks and no gloves. How, how do well, we do this? I will this? tell you, Joe. Um, so yes, they are being enforced. The problem is there's a lot of people doing it. So I've had several instances in my ward where people were doing illegal construction and I called ISD, and if I couldn't get a hold of ISD, I called the police. Uh, so I would encourage people, if you see uh, illegal construction going on, and most, unless they have a special, uh, per, special reason to do it, like if someone's living in the house already and they need to make the repairs to make the house livable, that's really the only circumstance. Um, and I had an instance where this was happening. I called the police, and the police went down and shut them down. Uh, it is an ISD issue, but... Uh, ISD is not there 24 hours a day. A lot of these contractors know that, uh, and especially when some of the people, even our staff, are being told to not go outside unless necessary. So I would tell people to call 311. If that doesn't work, uh, you can call the police and ask them to do something about it. And if that doesn't work, call your ward counselor and let them know because we will uh, we'll, we will make sure that that happens. That's good because I've got counselor Nidagang on speed dial these days. Ben, I wanted to go back to one thing when we were talking about um, the testing part of it and the, um, the urgency of people to follow these physical distancing guidelines. One of the things that has come up are the runners in this city, using the community path, 
using sidewalks, doing what they do. They are guidelines, Social, uh, physical distancing are guidelines. How else can the city, and I know uh, there's one thing I want to address to both of you after I finish this tirade. Um, how are we going to enforce that with runners coming within six inches of a mom and her kid? H how do we do that? So, yeah, thank you for that. I think jogging, so I'm, I'm someone who runs, although I'll tell you, I've, I've stopped in the last week or so because I don't, I haven't figured out how to do it with a mask, although I have heard some people have figured out how to do that. Um, so this is something we have gotten a, a lot of concerns about. And, you know, I'll tell you from my own experience, I've found 80, 90% of joggers, when they pass, they make, you know, they go way out in the street, cross the street. But of course, there are a number of bad actors and it's incredibly frustrating. Um, so I think, you know, the city in the last week or so has started to put out a lot of signs in places like the community path, um, on all parks, just sort of, you know, for the folks who aren't constantly checking the city for guidelines, who aren't tapped into exactly the latest advice, it's helpful for there to be as many reminders as possible. I've heard a lot of people ask for um, the mayor's office to send out one of their 311 calls to the city, really emphasizing giving folks space on the sidewalk, specifically around jogging, and I would certainly support that. Um, I think, you know, there's always a question of how do you enforce things in a city of about 90,000 people, it's hard, right? Because, you know, if you got 89,995 people following it, we're a small city and you still got some scoff laws. And, you know, I don't think it's reasonable to expect that we'll be able to personally enforce every single one. But I think we do need to build up the social norms that if you are someone who needs to run for exercise, and I'm speaking to you as, as one of your own, don't get close to people. Right. Right. Have I some did, respect I, for where people I think are at it, and how much anxiety and fear there is right now. I think it's worth um, coming from you. You know, if it comes from this over 65 guy who just, you know, trots along, it, it, it's probably not ringing true. But, you know, here's a healthy guy. He's going to stay healthy during the COVID-19 pandemic. And he's figured out how to do it without running within six inches of people. Now, Joe, let me ask you a question. How sure. do you keep your glasses from fogging up? Because I actually brought a tutorial here for all my fellow glasses wearers on the best way that I've found. I don't wear glasses when I'm walking. I don't want to see half the stuff that's out there. So, well, I, I know we only have a minute left, but before we go, let me just quickly show everybody. If you have a cloth mask, what I've done is I take a little bit of wire and some Gorilla Glue, and I made myself a little nose piece. Ah, uh, almost like That's the, the secret. Yeah. None of the other tricks work. There you go. From Ben Ewan Campen, Crafts at Home, Hey, one other thing Does I want to work talk on sunglasses as well. Oh yeah, it could it could? One other thing I want to talk about because we probably have uh, a little bit. Uh, we have thirty seconds. Beefed up three one one. If people are having problems navigating these other systems that are out there, the mayor has beefed up the three one one system with some experts to to listen and hopefully to point you in the right direction. So please take advantage of the city councilor's offers for help. Take advantage of the 311 system. Remember all of your social distancing guidelines. And I hope to see you both real soon next week or in the coming weeks. Thanks for joining me. Thanks for, for having us, Joe. Thanks, guys. For Somerville Media Center, I'm Joe Lynch. See you next time.